Hey, BMCC Online, I'm Just. I'm your host this weekend. We're so glad that you're here today. We're in our Rooted series. Uh, today's topic is serve. When Jesus asks us to follow him, follow him is an action and we have to move. One of those things that we can do to move towards Jesus is having a servant's heart. Uh, so that allows us to serve with other people. Pastor Jim is going to go ahead and talk to us today on the subject of serving. We're so glad that you could be here, and I look forward to chatting with you afterwards. So we're in a series that we've entitled Rooted, and uh, we've been in it for several weeks now. And as we've gone through it, if this is your first time here, welcome. <laughs> and you can pick up right where we are. But last Sunday, uh, we took a little bit of time at the end of the service to write down prayer requests and put them, there are a couple spots on, on the walls on either side, and, and some of you wrote down your prayer requests and put them in the walls, and we're going to hear more about that at the end of the service. But... Um, we prayed as a staff over those requests, and I prayed a couple times throughout the week over each of those requests. And the other thing is some of them sunk deep <laughs> as I prayed for them, and, I, and they've been on my heart and mind as the week has gone on. So uh, we're going to maybe reintroduce that practice a little bit of, of using those walls and prayer requests. And if you have a prayer request that you would like the staff or our prayer team to pray over, whether you sign it or not, this is a great place to do that. So at the end of the service, if you want to make use of those prayer walls, do that and know that you will be prayed for and over with that. So you start to follow Christ. You start to follow Jesus. But what does that even really mean to follow Jesus? What does it look like? You begin to realign your life. And it's kind of, there's, at first, maybe some some significant changes, but they don't necessarily feel so big, but, but your commitments start to shift and your values start to shift and the way you spend your time and the way you spend your resources, it all kind of begins to change just a little bit because what was most important to you is now less important and what was not all that important is now more important. Things take on a new priority and prominence, new gravity as we try to follow Jesus. Have you ever had something that was real, you really valued, this was important to you in your life? For me, my prized possession when I was a kid was my Louisville Slugger baseball bat. I got it for my birthday one year, and, it, it, and I played little league baseball. And I got this Louisville Slugger baseball bat. It was a wooden bat like all Louisville Sluggers were, like all bats should be. And, uh, but it was big and it was heavy. And I tried to play baseball, Little League, with my, my big Louisville slugger bat, but it was too heavy for me to swing fast enough to hit the ball. And so I always had to use a smaller bat. But one day I was going to grow into that bat and it was going to hit home runs. And I was going to use that. I was going to be the next Willie Stargell. Does he, you ever heard of Willie Stargell? And I was going to play for the Pittsburgh Pirates, and, and I wasn't going to play first base. I was going to play third base for the Pittsburgh Pirates, and I was Willie Stargell too. <laughs> I don't look like him, but I was going to be him. That was my plan. But that baseball bat, it was my prized possession. And then we moved to another place, and when we moved, uh, I didn't play in the Little League, but I still played a lot of pickup baseball. Back in the olden days, that's what we did. It was sandlot. You know, you played baseball. It was a thing. And, and, uh, and that was still my prized possession. But it moved from being displayed in my room to the corner. And then we moved again, and it moved from the corner of my room to the closet. And then we moved again. <laughs> and it moved from the closet to the garage. Funny thing about that Louisville slugger bat, I never once hit a home run with it, ever. I never played third base for the Pittsburgh Pirates. <laughs> and I have no idea where that bat is today. 
I don't know. It was my prized possession. It was the thing I valued more than anything in the world. And now, somewhere along the line, it, it just became less important and less important. Now I don't even know what happened to it. Our values shift and change. And then sometimes something happens in our lives and, and something that was really important becomes less important and something that was unimportant becomes so much more important. And so it is to follow Christ. As we follow Christ, the lens through which we see life changes and, and things become more valuable that didn't used to be valuable at all to us. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. The Apostle Paul says these words, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can be good. That's not true. <laughs> it doesn't say that, does it? It doesn't say that. But you know what? Sometimes, sometimes we think that's what it's about. Sometimes we think as we follow Christ, that's actually, we're just supposed to be good. We're just supposed to now, now that we are Christ followers, go be good, go play nice, go play by the rules, go don't do bad. And now there's a sliver of truth to that. As you follow Christ, hopefully you're not out doing bad. That's not the idea. But it's not about going to do or to be good. So what happens as we follow Christ beyond being baptized, beyond reading your Bible, beyond going to church, beyond being involved in a small group where you are sharing your life intimately with a group of strangers who becomes dear friends? <laughs> beyond that, what is, what is it? Let's read it for real this time. Do you know, the funny thing is, I, I read that passage and uh, if somebody took that little clip and took it out of context, they would think that I was really teaching that stuff. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So we can do good things, good works. So we can go do good works in this world. Do something good with your time. Do something good with your energy. Do something good with your creativity. Do something good with the few short years that you've been given. Do good in this world. Because as we do good, we reflect the image of Christ. Because he did good in the world. Now, there's a difference between doing something big and doing something good. Sometimes we think, that means I have to go do something big. Go do something big. No. He didn't say go do something big. He said do something good. Good works. Do something good. There's a major difference. In a few weeks, it's graduation, right? And so kids, whether they're high school kids or college kids, they're going to, there's going to be someone stand up in front of them, and they're going to say, you finished all the classes. You, you did it, you've got satisfactory grades, and, and you, you've done it all, and we're going to hand you a piece of paper, and now they're going to say, go change the world. <laughs> That's quite a task. That's a daunting task to, to, to lay in front of some kids who, who finished a course. <laughs> I mean, it's a big thing. Actually, I love those speeches. I'm a sucker for them. <laughs> because I get inspired. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go change the world. And, th and that's good. But what if instead of saying, go change the world, what if instead we say, now go do something good? Because that's less daunting. You can do that. <laughs> you can go do something good. And, and maybe not many of us are going to go out and really actually change the world with our invention or something that we create that, that actually changes the way everybody does things. But you can do good, and in these micro goods that we do, it does change the world for good. It does great things in our world. Go <laughs> change the world. What a daunting task. But the little changes, the little acts of service and kindness and goodness 
that we do matters. We used to, I used to be the Texas State Youth Director um, when I was in youth ministry. And what that meant was I, I worked for free <laughs> and uh, directed all these conventions. And it was good. It was really good. But we closed for three years in a row. We closed our convention with one girl would get up and she would sing the same song for three years in a row. And it was a song by Chris Rice. It might be familiar to some of you. Uh, it's called Go Light Your World. And, and the, the lyrics are, there's a candle in every soul, some brightly burning, some dark and cold. There's a spirit who brings a fire, ignites the candle and makes his home. So carry your candle, run to the darkness, seek out the helpless, confused and torn. Hold out your candle for all to see. Take your candle, go light the world. But then the second verse is where the power. Frustrated brother, see how he's tried to light his own candle some other way. See how your sister, she's been robbed and lied to, still holds a candle without a flame. So carry your candle, run to the darkness, seek out the helpless, confused and worn. Something like that. Take your candle, go light the world. What if we, instead of sending people out to go change the world, what if we said, just go out and light your candle <laughs> and light somebody else's candle around you? Do an act of love and service and grace. Those things matter more than anything. The challenge isn't go change the world. <laughs> it's go serve. Go with what you have. Give your time, your creativity, one of my favorite verses is in 1 Thessalonians 2, 8. 1 Thessalonians 2, 8 says this. We loved you so much that we shared with you not only God's good news, but our own lives too. This is, again, it's the Apostle Paul. He says, we love you so much that, that we shared with you not only God's good news, but our own lives too. That's part of our purpose statement. In fact, our purpose statement is taken from that passage, sharing life, love, and faith. Because that's what we want to be about. We want to share our lives with people. We want to share our love and our faith. So last summer, I was driving through Tushi and on my motorcycle, and I was low on gas. Do you know that it's really expensive to get gas in Tushi? I don't know. It's like 50 cents more a gallon. I don't know. It's a lot. But I had to stop and get gas, and I stopped in Tushi to gas up, and as I'm gassing up, and I'm, I'm wearing my biker thug outfit, you know? People are like, look at that thug. <laughs> I'm wearing my biker thug outfit, and a car pulls up, and a, an elderly lady gets out, and she comes over, and uh, it's a Sunday afternoon. She comes over, and uh, she hands me a track. Do you know what a track, it, it's like a little booklet and the little booklet, and it tells the story of the fall of humanity and sin, and uh, basically, uh, this is the way that you can ask Jesus in your heart so that you don't go to hell when you die. So she hands me this tract, and, and then she says, God requires an answer for your life. And I'm thinking, whoa, I am a biker thug. And this lady comes up, and she's an elderly little lady, and she comes up, and I'm like, here's what I really respect about that. <laughs> she cared enough about a biker thug that she was willing to come up. I'm not really a biker thug, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> but she was willing to come up, a total stranger, and say, here, God requires an answer for your life. I appreciated that. And I was also a little bit irritated. <laughs> Here's why. Three hours before, I stood on this platform and told the story of Jesus. And she's telling me, I, I, I was irritated, and, and it's okay. Uh, the, thing, the thing is, she didn't know me. She didn't know me from anybody. She had an agenda for me to pray a prayer so she could move on with her day or whatever. I don't even know what her agenda was. But I was irritated because she didn't know me. Jesus said, go make disciples. And to make a disciple, you share your life with people. You have to share a piece of who you are. You have to share love. Here's, here, this would have made it all different, okay? If she pulled up to the gas station and got out with a bag of fresh cookies. <laughs> I'm serious. 
Ch fresh chocolate chip cookies. And she handed these to me and said, you know, I made these just for you today. I didn't know it was going to be for you, but it's for you. And she handed those cookies to me. I'm making this up now. She handed those cookies to me and she says, I'm going to tell you about something. And then she told me about Jesus. I'd have got saved right then, <laughs> right there. I'd have kneeled down <laughs> right at the gas station and eaten those cookies and, and give my life to Jesus again all over. But the thing is, it's sharing life, sharing love, sharing faith. It's all wrapped up together. How do we do this? We serve. <laughs> we serve people. Um, our call, go make disciples, right? Back to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are God's masterpiece. Created us, uh, he created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. We, you and I, we are created to do good things on planet Earth. Now, we can get really caught up in the details of that passage because we can go to the fact, okay, God created some good things that I'm supposed to do. What are those good things? I, I want to make sure that I'm doing those good things and not other good things because if I say yes to other good things, I might be doing something that's, not, that, that's good, but it's not the thing I'm supposed to do. What was I created to do? What is that thing I was created to do? And we can get really tripped up on that because what if I do the wrong good? What if I do the wrong good? I, I don't have energy left to do the right good? Or, or what if I was supposed to do a good thing years ago, but I missed the good thing I was supposed to do? And because I missed the good thing I was supposed to do, I'm never going to do the good thing. And so I'm not going to be who God created me to be. It spirals pretty quick. <laughs> it does. But what if we worried less about the thing and did something instead? Something good. Do something good. Because here's the thing. When you do something good, it leads to the opportunity to do another something good, which leads to an opportunity to do another something good. Oftentimes, it's not just about doing that something good. That is changing us on the inside. And it's moving us from being people who ask for something to be done good to us, instead becoming people who do good for others. It opens up all kinds of doors for us. So then you might ask the question, okay, something good. Am I supposed to do something good at church or am I supposed to do something good in the community? Which is it? Which is it? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. You're supposed to do something good at church and something good in the community. It's, it's both because there's opportunities. There's all kinds of opportunities. In the church, there's all kinds of opportunities to do good. Do you know what the biggest Probably the most important thing that we do at church every week, it isn't in this room, it's down the hall. <laughs> it's, in, it's in the children's wing. I believe that, that the kids' ministry is so important. And, and we all, we're always looking for somebody to help out in the kids, man. <laughs> One Sunday a month. Here's the thing with kids' ministry. 47.2% of people who claim to be Christians, 47.2, say, I came to Jesus, I gave my life to Jesus before the age of 11. So 47% of people who call themselves Christ followers gave their lives to Jesus before 11. And then 36.8% gave their lives between 12 and 19. So you've got 47% and then 36, 37% gave their lives to Jesus, people who call themselves Christ followers. They gave them their lives to Jesus as young people. And then the next category, age 19 to 29, is 11.3% gave their lives. So Christ followers, if you're going to be a Christ follower, the biggest category is children. And the biggest influencers in the children's lives are parents, not the church. The parents are by far the strongest influence in children's lives. So parents drip Jesus into people's lives, into your kids' lives. It matters. But the second most important place that children find faith beyond the home, beyond their parents, is church. And so, it's so important. 
So if you're like, oh, I guess I got to serve in, in children's ministry, then my guilt trip just worked. <laughs> but children's are so important. And then the next most important stage in life is youth ministry. And then the next most important is young adult ministry. But after that, after young adult, after the age 29, after when someone turns 30, only 4.7% of Christ followers claim they came to Christ after the age 30. Why is that? Why does it shrink? Why does it start big and get smaller and smaller and smaller by the time we get to be adults? <laughs> Maybe it has something to do with our hearts get harder. I don't know. The influence, uh, our, our rhythms of life, I don't know. But it's so important. What was I talking about? Oh, yeah, serve. Should I serve inside the church or outside the church? Other opportunities to serve inside the church. We have an information center every Sunday. You could serve and help people find where they're going on a Sunday. You could help with sports camp. That's coming up fast. You could help with a work day. We just did a work day yesterday, and we had like 40 people out here doing things. It was great. You could serve on the worship team. And if you can't sing, you could serve in the sound booth. <laughs> Sorry. That didn't mean to apply anything back there. <laughs> they might be great singers. I don't know. You could be a small group leader. You can be on our prayer team. You can be a volunteer in the kitchen. There's so many opportunities in church to serve. But then there's opportunities outside the church too. What does that look like? If, if there's, if there's a, 10 things you can do in the church, there are 10,000 things you can do outside the church. It's finding a way to allow your, your circle of influence to be your service project. <laughs> this is where I serve. I serve at school because I'm a student, or I serve at, at my workplace. Or just find a way to pour out in your realm what God is pouring into you. Bonus content for this. Bonus content. Two things Jesus never taught. Two things Jesus never taught. Jesus never taught that um, the customer is always right. Never taught his disciples. Customer is always right. Make sure you're keeping the customers happy. They're always right. Never taught that. You know what else Jesus never taught? He never taught you deserve the best. <laughs> he didn't teach that to his disciples. Now, we in our culture, we, we have a, a consumer-based culture, and so the customer is always right and you deserve the best. But Jesus never taught those. Those aren't his values. Those are our culture's values. Because we, we go to church or we go to whatever, and we think, what can I get out of this? How will this benefit me? Instead of going, how can I serve? What can I do to help? And in our workplaces, same thing. Okay, bonus content. Next bonus content. What, does this, what is a servant leader anyways? A servant leader is somebody who is looking to help more than they're looking to be helped. You're just looking to help. That's what a servant leader looks like. It's somebody who is looking to give more than they're taking. It's somebody who um, doesn't think about their station. Yeah, you might be the boss, and, and you might have earned this high position. And, and in our community, there's some, there's some pretty high positions. Even in this church, there's, some of you hold some high positions in our community. But it's not about the position you hold, but it's more about the condition of humans made in the image of God that you serve. That's the most important thing. Ella Wheeler Wilcox wrote this poem. I've read it before, but I like it so much. There are two kinds of people on earth today, just two kinds of people, no more, I say. Not the good and the bad, for it is well understood that the good are half bad and the bad are half good. No, the two kinds of people on earth, I mean, are the people who lift and the people who lean. Okay, in the kingdom of God, things are different than in, our, than in the kingdom of the world. You will never reach a point in the kingdom of God where you're the point. You'll never reach a point where you're the point. We do reach a point in our world where you're the point now, but not in the kingdom of God. Ancient Israel, people wore sandals, right? They, they walked around in sandals, and, and the roads were made out of dirt, 
And some Roman roads might be made of cobblestone, but you still, you still got dirty with exposed toes, you know? And so you're walking around in your sandals. Anybody wear sandals to church today? Yeah, some of you did. You're walking around and, and your, your feet are open and there's, the roads are dirty. And so when you came to a home and you entered the home, there was a servant or a slave that would meet you there. If, if the person who owned the home had any money, had any standing, they would have a slave or a servant who would meet you at the door and would wash your feet before you entered the home. It was, it was a refreshing thing, and it also got the, the dust from the road off of your feet. And if there was no servant, if the person wasn't rich enough to have a slave or a servant, oftentimes the homeowner would meet you at the door with a bowl of water, and they would wash your feet and dry them with a towel. It's, it's what you did. And so the disciples show up to celebrate the fast. Uh, Passover feast. And as they showed up to celebrate the Passover feast, they entered the room that they were going to celebrate the Passover feast in. All of these men are equals. They're disciples. They're, they're followers of Jesus. They're trying to model themselves after Jesus. They also believe that Jesus is going to set himself up as king over all Israel. So all 12 disciples are jockeying for position of authority. All 12 of them want a high position in the, the cabinet of Jesus when he becomes king. That's what they're thinking. And so they show up at the upper room to eat, and there's no slave, and there's no servant, and there's no homeowner to greet them and wash their feet. And so they come in, and they sit down, and they start to eat. Because any one of those 12 could have said, hey, let's not do this for you. I'll wash your feet. But none of them did, not even one of them, because they would have to take on a lower position. And remember, they're jockeying for position in the cabinet of Jesus. They're trying to, to gain a higher status. They're trying, I'm, I want to be in a higher position than the other 12 or the other 11 in front of me. And so they're, they're hoping to get, and if, and if I were to wash your feet, I would be in a lower status. And so I'm not going to do that. We're equals here. And so they come in. And they sit down and they begin to eat or begin the celebration of the Passover. John chapter 13, verse 3. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything. Whoa. <laughs> what, what, what did he have authority over? Everything. Everything. Life, death, heaven, hell, angels, demons. Health, <laughs> everything. He had authority over everything in all creation. He was, he was, everything was under him. Everything. And that he had come from God and we returned to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. This is bizarre to us, to wash your feet at the table. <laughs> it's bizarre. It was bizarre to them, too, because it happened at the door. But how many of you, when you were a kid, your mom said, did you wash your feet before coming to the table? Nobody, right? Nobody. Did you wash your hands? Yeah. Wash your face? Whatever. But, but did you wash your feet? And so here, the king of all creation, the one who's over everything, puts a towel on his waist and washes their feet at the table. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never, ever wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands and head as well, Lord, just not my feet. <laughs> Jesus replied, a person who has bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you, for Jesus knew who would betray him. And that is what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. 
there's a lot that happens in this little interchange. And it, it would take a, probably a whole sermon to kind of start to unpack it. So we're, we're not going to go to unpack that because I want to move to the next section, verse 12. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, Do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, because that is what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth, slaves are no greater than their masters, nor is the master more important than the one who sends the message. Stop there for just a second. <laughs> How do we see ourselves in that way as servants? I mean, too often we go through life looking for what I can get out of this, looking for the best service, looking for somebody to, to handle our situation well, right? We don't see ourselves as the servant of others. And Jesus is saying, this is the mindset that God Almighty has placed, well, is in me. And this is the mindset that you, as my followers, as you are trying to become like me, this is what I want from you, to be like me. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. Now that you know, <laughs> this is what I want from you. God will bless you. We have to find a way to move from demanding we be served to instead serving others. If you want to be like Christ, and if you want your life to take on more meaning and purpose and greater significance, if you want to change your world in micro ways, find ways to serve people around you. Find ways to serve people around you. I looked up, how do you have influence? I looked it up, Googled it. How do you have influence? And there's all kinds of articles on the way you can be an influencer whether you're a social media influencer or somebody in your company and, and this is the way you rise to influence in your company, you know what none of them said? Serve everybody around you. <laughs> Serve people. Do you know, I, I was thinking about sometimes the guy who polishes shoes has more influence than the person who's trying to find a way to have influence. Sometimes the, the person who opens the door has more influence Sometimes a person who waits tables has great influence. Why? Because they're serving. Sometimes people will come to me here at the church, and they'll feel, <laughs> they'll ask a question. Like, I, I, I feel like I shouldn't even ask this question, but what about this? And, and I'm looking for some help with this or that, or, or I, I, I don't even like to ask. And you know what I tell them all the time? If they're doing something in the life of the church, I tell them, if you're pulling an oar, <laughs> you have my ear. If you're serving, if you're serving in church, if you're serving in the community, if you're serving, if you're pulling an oar, you have my ear. Ask anything you want. I'll try to help <laughs> if I can. Because service matters so much. Servants have an outsized influence on the kingdom of God. You will never be more like Jesus Christ. You will never be more like Jesus Christ than when you serve. And we, as we go through Rooted, we're seeking to become more like him and find ways to serve. And there are opportunities everywhere. You don't have to go change your world. Just go do something good. Just go do something good, and that'll lead to another something good which will lead to another something good. And what you'll find is as you pour yourself out, God fills you back up. And you pour yourself out again and he fills you back up. Go do something good. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed today's message by Pastor Jim. If you call BMCC online, your home church, we ask that you continue the act of worship through the giving of your tithes. You can do so over at bluemountainchurch.com. Up at the top, there is a give section. Now, let me leave you with this blessing. May you be blessed as you serve others with a selfless heart, extending love, compassion, and kindness. 
May your acts of service bring joy, healing, and hope to those in need, reflecting the light of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the only hope this world has ever known. Amen. Have a great rest of your day.